It's linear algebra. Whatever linear algebra we need, I'm gonna is in your prerequisites, and it's also the linear algebra that I will revise. Just like I'm revising probability, I will revise linear algebra at the same level. And when I revise linear algebra, there'll be all sorts of cool applications. I'm not just gonna revise linear algebra in the abstract. Okay. Uh, my course is more like a physics course where I try to relate math to the world as opposed to math and the abstract. But math and the abstract is also important. It's not the topic of this course, but for me math is a language that allows me to talk about things in the world. It allows me to talk about them much more efficiently. Because once I have a word that describes many things, like I have this formula, that space rule, and that formula says a lot of things about the world. And so I can communicate uh, with that, just through space rule. So, communicating through the equations makes communication more, um, uh, far more efficient. Uh, of course, war, sometimes we use a language not just uh, to communicate, but we love to use a language for the language sake. You know, like poets love to write poems, and there's value in writing poems, so there is value in people just doing theory with math. Because one day the theory might be useful to those looking at practical applications. This course, however, we're going to just basically adopt math to the extent that we need to be able to communicate ideas and communicate ideas efficiently. Um, oh yeah, well, one request uh, coming from the TAs. If you could please, uh, if you have questions about the homework, next time about how to handle it, etc. Please use the Google group uh, to post such questions. And when you do the Google group, again, try not to spam too much. Um, and the TAs are kind of busy. They have to get their PhDs four years, masters in two years. So, and if they don't meet those deadlines, they're in trouble. So I keep them busy um, doing their machine learning projects. Um, so don't email them all the time and go by the lab and so on because they actually, you know, the Google group is uh, more useful. If it's a personal question, obviously uh, uh, we're here to help. <coughs> okay. Um, so it's, I mentioned in the last class when we looked at graphical models, there are um, two things. The, the, the first thing was that graphical models allow us to go from a representation that is exponential in size to a small set of compact representations of low dimensionality. Okay. Um, so it allows us to beat the, uh, the representation to some extent seems to allow us to beat the curse of dimensionality. If provided each table is small, provided that the network is not too densely connected, we're able to beat the curse of dimensionality by using the model. Okay, so storage stopped being a problem. Because storage itself would be prohibitive. If you have a thousand variables, two to the thousand is just not the kind of storage you want to be buying in future shop. We saw many examples. <coughs> and then the second part um, was that I wanted to illustrate something that is, will be obvious to you now, but this took many years of people working very hard on this problem to figure it out. And at the beginning, what is this? This is going back to maybe 50s, 60s. Uh, when people in AI, people in AI were trying to wonder how if you have these networks, and in those days these networks were devoid of probability and they were known as expert systems. They fail blatantly because the world is not deterministic. The world is very stochastic. There's, partial, there's uncertainty in everything we do. Um, and so the lack of probability made expert systems um, impractical for real applications eventually. But the other question that people had was how can we do local computation and have a globally consistent system? <laughs> that is, if I do computation just in this part of the room, make sure that when I do this computation, 
the global answer is still unaffected. Okay, that I still will not, I will have the right answer. Can we arrive at the right answer just by doing local computation here and then local computation there and local computation over there? That would be great because that basically is saying, can we distribute the computation? And each team, it's like if I send you all out in small teams, you know, like this sort of exercise, you each work out the solution to your sub problem, you get back here, and we have a solution to the big problem. Okay. How to do that is not obvious. And uh, it turns out that these three cases uh, are enough to, um, to warrant that, it, uh, that it's. Uh, possible to, in fact, do local computation and have a system that's global. <coughs> Essentially, we're going to use this property um, that we introduced in the last class, that given my parents, given my children, given my uh, wives, I am independent of everything else, of every other person on the planet. Okay, that's sort of the, the analogy. Okay, how does, so we saw two examples. Uh, so three examples that are key. Um, the one is when you have a chain, when you have, and then there's two Vs, um, when you have a parent node with two children, when you have two nodes with a child, and when you have this sort of a chain for the father, parent, child. Um, and so in this case here, we said that um, the child is independent of the grandparent and the parent. Um, in the second case, we argue that given that you're, um, you're independent of the other children once you know your grandparent. And then this is the tricky case because this case is saying that if you, um, given your children, you become dependent. And so the analogy here, if you want to think in terms of genes, is given the, my, to know my genetic material, you just need to know the genetic material of my parents. You don't need to know the genetic material of my grandparents, right? Because my parents inherited the summer. Likewise, to know the genetic material of my sister, you don't need to know my genetic material, you just need to know the genetic material of my parents. That's case two. However, to know the genetic material of my child, you do need to know the genetic material of my wife as well. Okay, so, so I'm not independent of my wife. Now, all that seems to be very small cases, very local. But let's look at them. Uh, let's now look at the graph that is very large. And let's instantiate a node, and I'm going to call it xi. And I'm going to assume that the graph contains three kinds, actually five kinds of nodes. There will be the node xi that I care about. And let's assume I want to compute what's the probability of xi given everyone else. I will argue that the probability of xi, oh, I'm going to define x not i to be equal to the set of all other nodes. That is, all the nodes that are not xi. No matter how big this graph is, this graph could have billions of nodes. And I'm going to summarize that set to say that it consists of the nodes R. It consists of all the nodes that are parents of XI. I'm going to call them U. It consists of all the children of XI, which I'm going to call Y. And it's going to consist of all the nodes Z, which are the sort of the, the partners of node XI. These are all the possible nodes that can exist in the graph. Something is either your parent, your child, your co-parent, or something else, which I call remaining, R for remaining. All right, so the claim is
that the probability of the node, given all the other nodes, okay, only depends, will be a probability that will only depend on on the use, on the y's, and on the z's. So the claim is that R will disappear. <coughs> Let's prove it. Actually, before I go to prove it, that, are we clear what the claim is? So the R is just anything other than the parents, child, and co-parents. Is that right? Correct. So R could be this guy here. This could be also R. This could be R. So R is only a node outside that shaded reach. And so my claim is once you have that shaded region, you don't need to look beyond. So if I want to compute the probability of him passing this course, sorry to keep it on you, but I only need to sort of know the immediate factors that affect him. I don't need to know what, how tall the waves are right now in Kobe. Okay, so here is the, the proof sketch. Xi given x not i is equal to the probability of xi and x not i divided by x not i. So in this step, I'm using conditional probability. Sorry, uh, what does it mean by the probability of xi? Oh, so just landing on that node, maybe, or oh, by that I mean. Um, that's a good question. So, so by that I mean, let's do an example. So, let's take one of these examples. <coughs> right, I need a slide. Actually, let me use the board for that. So let's assume, so essentially what I'm saying is I have a node. I'm going to call this variable xi, and you can, xi could be, for instance, uh, temperature. And let's assume that the temperature is either cold or hot. And I'm going to use zero for cold, and I'm going to use, so I'm assuming all the variables are um, either 0 or 1, and then temperature is probably affected by um, pressure, so U1 could be like pressure um, by heater, and then pressure could be say high or low. 0, 1, I, low. Um, the heater could be of R, R, and so on. So each variable has a meaning, and each variable side that takes the value 0 or 1. So for simplicity, we assume that the variables are, are all binary for now. Um, they can take more than one value. They can be like like I could have a variable that's dies and then sorry die and then the die can take values one two three four five six. And let's assume for now that they're all fine. <coughs> so when I say um, I mean you can simple. When I say p of x i given u one and u two, I'm basically talking about a distribution. So 
the given operator has precedence, so you should always read this as the probability of xi given both u1 and u2. When something is given, it basically means that it has taken a value. It has been observed. So you might have, for example, 0 and a 1. So assume that if something is given, you know it's value. Um, sometimes we're lazy and we don't say what the value is. We just say that it has been given, that its value is known. And so given that this value is a known, this is a probability of our xi. So if we plot it, and we have xi here, which means temperature, and you have 0 here and 1 here, we would have something like this. So, for example, 0 0.6 and 0 0.4. So, and then this is the graph of P of xi given u1 and u2. So, What's that graph again? Pardon? <coughs> Should I give the photo the graph? Well, this is a probability of xi being 0 or 1. So it really, uh, one way to write it, so these are all equivalent ways to write it. One way to write it is to write it as 0 0.4, 0 0.6. And I just reduce so okay. as a table or as a vector, if you will. And then another way to write it that's equivalent is as a graph. So with two bars. Um, this bar tells you the probability that's zero, and then the other bar gives you the probability that it's one. Okay, but this object is the probability of this variable. Okay. What's the temperature the what's the probability of temperature is high and what's the probability of temperature low? And then what I'm arguing is that if I have this, um, let's see, what affects a heater? Um, a heater is affected by um, R, and let's say that R <coughs> means electricity. Okay. So if there's electricity, if electricity is on, the heater will be on. If the electricity is off, the heater cannot be on. However, if you know that the heater is off, you don't need to know whether there's electricity to know that the temperature is not going to go up. And so that, that's the intuition for it. So this R variable will disappear. And you only basically care about the variables that are next to you in order to be able to compute these two numbers. What we're going to be doing in inference next is we're going to try to compute these numbers. Up to now, we haven't done any computation. But as we go forward, our task will be someone tells us this variable has this particular value. What's the value of this variable? And then knowing these properties that we're going over is going to help us do the calculations more efficiently. Okay, and so now what we're proving is that the probability of xi, given all the other variables, is really only the probability of xi given its um, partners, children, and parents, which together we call the Markov blanket. And the term blanket is basically that. Once you have that blanket of those three guys, you can cover the node. <coughs> Whatever, that's the name that they came up with. <laughs> OK, so if we wanted to know what's the probability that the xi is on or off, or both, in fact, um, then we would just uh, use first the rule of conditioning that p of a given b is just p of a and b divided by p of b. That's what I'm applying here. And next, we need to um, we need to expand. Okay, so, so in particular, this is the probability of x i. And now I'm going to just basically rewrite what uh, x not i is. It's r, it's u, it's y, and it's z. Now I need to normalize this. 
And the way I normalize this is by summing But this has to be a probability over A. This is a probability in terms of Xi. So the random variable is Xi. All the other variables we're assuming are given. They're to the right of the bar. Continue with our calculations. And so when you sum, to make this sum to 1, it must be true. you're summing over xi of the numerator. You have an expression on top and you just need to sum it when xi is 0 and when xi is 1 at the bottom to make sure that the <coughs> sum to 1. So 24 plus 26 is 1. The other way to see it is that the probability of x not i by marginalization is that you have so x not i as we said here x not i is all these variables. Uh, so in order to get it, you need to p of x not i. <coughs> is equal to the sum over xi of p of xi and x not i. Okay, so if you put all the variables together and you integrate up xi, you get just x not i. So we're using the rule of marginalization of p of a is equal to the sum of p of p of a. It's always the same two rules that I'm using throughout. Marginalization and condition. And then it's just, I see a lot of terrified faces. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is only true when, uh, like, xi, all the values of xi are, um, what's the word? There's no overlap between them, basically. Yeah, there, there's no overlap. In particular, if you look at the picture, you see that xi is xi, and then x not i is the other variable. Maybe that's the one thing that's confusing. When I say x not i, um, so it's important to realize that x not i is just a way to say everything that is not i, that is not xi. So it might be helpful to say this is actually probably that xi takes the value of 1. This is what we're actually calculating. Pardon? Like, what we're really calculating is the probability that xi takes the value of 1 given everything else. Because really, just to say the probability of xi is not really that meaningful. xi is a random event. This is the probability that random event takes a specific value, which in this case is 1. That is correct. So in this case, you only need the probability that xi takes a particular value. But if you have more than, because the probability of xi being 0 is just 1 minus the probability of xi being 1. But if you had more variables, then you, the, you would need this proof. But that's a good point. It could be something like And so the rules that I'm using throughout are always these rules, p of a and b is equal to p of a given b times p of b and in particular in this case I'm using it the form p of a given b is equal to p of a and b divided by p of b which is really the same thing I've just moved the p of b to the other side and then the other rule that I'm using so that's conditioning and then the other rule that I'm using throughout this marginalization, which says that P of A is equal to the sum over all the values that the B could take, either 0 or 1, of P of A and B. <coughs> so, if you actually do pattern matching, you'll see that, well, in my expression there, x not i happens to be a, and when I use this, and b is just equal to x i, and then when I talk about, yeah, when I talk about b given a,
you look pattern-matching with these two substitutions, you'll see that what I'm doing is just the basic rules of the rules. Right? And, and I'm using x not i just to group many variables into a single variable, so I don't have to write all the time r and u and y and z. Okay. Um, next, I'm going to expand this a bit more, and I'm going to write this now as the probability of a graph. So this is equal to the probability of xi given the parents of xi, which are all the u's, times the probability over all the nodes j of p of yj given the parents of yj, which are x, i, and z. Let me put some brackets here to indicate the order of multiplication. Times the probability of all the remaining variables, z and r and u. Okay. So recall that, um, let's bring it back. Let's recall the definition of a graphical model. So a definition of a graphical model is the probability factorizes the probability of each node given the parents of that node, right? That was the simplification we made. We still have not, I still have not proven to you that this is a good thing to do. It seems to be good, I'm giving you all these properties, but I have not shown this to you with data. That's going to be the subject of next week. Um, all I'm saying is the, this is the syntax. I'm going to represent the distribution by the product of children given parents. So like in this case, we saw an example where um, it's a probability of call given alarm, probability of alarm given both burglary and earthquake, probability of radio given an earthquake, and then you need a probability of earthquake, and you need a probability of burglary. And so here I'm going to do the same thing in the proof. So I have u given the parents of u, which are these guys. I have y given its parents. And then I would have R given its parents, sorry, U given its parents, and I would have uh, Z given its parents, and I would have all the other R's. But I'm, instead of writing it, them as a graphical model, I'm just going to put them all together grouped. Now the normalization factor for this is the sum of our XI and again, the denominator is just the thing that makes the numerator sum to 1. And because it's a distribution over xi, we need to sum over xi being 0 or 1. And then it's just a question of writing the same tedious expression at the bottom. And this is as scary as it gets in this course. Get yourselves a nice, uh, relaxing drink and go over it. <laughs> or whatever relaxes your music. Whatever. Okay, so I've just rewritten the whole expression. Here comes, I'm going to answer your question soon. Here comes the one thing I can do quick. What can I cancel? in this expression. Okay. That tells me that quite a few of you are following. I can just cancel these guys because they don't depend on xi. And then if I look at this, this is just equal to the probability of xi given you times the probability and instead of taking the product over the y, uh, uh, hang on, let me not be lazy. I'm going to write the pro product over all the children given xi and their parents 
provided by the same stuff. And that's it. That's the proof. Quite simple. It took people uh, a day or so to figure this out. Take one message. If you want to know the probability of a variable being on or off, or being value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, and in fact, as we will see later when I introduce continuous variables, the probability of the Gaussian variable will be being between a certain range. It's completely independent of all the variables beyond its mark of blank. That means that if we want to do, ask a question, what's the probability of this variable, we only need to care about the mark of blank. This is essentially the principle that leads to the design of algorithms. When we have very large graphs, uh, the algorithms that we use exploit this property to be able to do a computation efficiently. And that's the end of that scary derivation. And now let's look at inference. that you have to just look at the Markov blanket, but doesn't that depend upon what the degree of variance is between it and, and the next, so like the sort of clustering of, is that a bearing on that? No. If you know the values of the variables in your Markov blanket, you don't need to know anything beyond. Believe the proof. <laughs> <laughs> or if you don't believe the proof, go home. Draw a graph like this, put in names of friends and girlfriends and whatever, and start doing manipulations. And you'll see that it is true. It's intuitively, it's not entirely obvious. It's, it's quite a cool result. So like the most crucial part of the proof is um, depending on the fact of the graphical model is correct, right? Like when you were able to replace it with the... Yes. So, so, this For indirect graphical models, sorry, uh, you, you're worried about the graph not being direct. <coughs> I, I just mean that like the graphical model, like I feel like this whole proof is just depending on the graphical model, right? So if the graphical model is false, then this whole proof is. Oh, but this an arbitrary. That was an arbitrary. That, to the extent that it was directed and a cyclic, beyond that, it's arbitrary. You could draw any graph. You know, you know, I drew it in a way that. A node can only have parents, children, co-parents, or any other stuff. There's no other possible graphs that you could draw that satisfy the directed and the cyclic property. So, so those things aren't true. If it's uh, if it has cycles or yeah, I just imagine that I point sense. to myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then that kind of breaks. Okay. But you wouldn't want to do that anyway. <laughs> You get into like silly logical fallacies if you introduce these weird graphs. But like, 
there is other kinds of graphs, though, which are not covered in this course, which are the undirected graphs, the random fields and so on. For those graphs, we also have semantics, which are slightly different. However, they are compatible. You can actually map one mathematical framework to the other, so it, it's all consistent. And there was one more question. Are transitive edges in these graphs okay? Like, Pardon? Are transitive edges in these graphs okay? Transitive edges. So like if you have um, A influences B, B influences C, and A influences C? Yeah, that's cool. That's okay? Yeah. Okay. So that doesn't form a cycle. So that? that's a very good question. So um, a graph that, let me try to draw it here. <coughs> So the graph that was suggested was one that looks like this. That's fine. Okay. We saw a lot of that when we look at the regulatory networks. Um, that was kind of common, actually. You know, the graph of the genes and so on. Of the last lecture had a lot of this type of structure. But these directed and cyclic, they're not very restrictive uh, properties. You can draw. Uh, you can model many things, as we saw last week, you know, from uh, marketing campaigns to uh, military applications to applications in medicine and so on. So they're, they're quite powerful. The syntax is not restricted. All right. New lecture. And I think... I've tried to uh, make sure that each calendar entry matches one lecture, but I think um, I'm going to delay this <laughs> delay it by one lecture. And uh, we're going to do this today and Friday, and I'm going to do HMS on Monday. Uh, Martin, so this lecture is now going to address this other question of how do we compute these probabilities? <coughs> Okay, we're going to start doing some computations. So, so far I've only explained to you what is a graphical model. Okay, it's a school tool that seems to beat the curse of dimensionality and can, it has all these independent, nice independent properties. Now we're going, to, we're going to learn how to actually use this to do something. Okay. And next week, on Monday, we're going to introduce uh, an application of this called a hidden Markov uh, uh, model. Um, who's heard of hidden Markov models or HMFs? In, in which domains? Bioinformatics and sequence lines. Bioinformatics are here. There was speech, speech, speech recognition. Siri is using this. Um, most of bioinformatics use this. So it's a very widely used model. And we'll be able to you guys will code it. It's actually not hard. It follows from this. Okay, so what is inference? Inference is the process of answering. It's a way of doing queries okay, in a, in a network. Now, let's assume that we have this network that consists of um, five random variables. And let's say that we observe a variable. So let's say that you, you're, you're driving on a highway and you get a call that says that your alarm is on. Okay, so we shade the node to indicate that that node has been observed. Okay. A shaded node means an observation. So you get a call and now inference is about computing the probability of what, whether there's an earthquake or a burglary given that you receive a call, given that call is true. So call is false or true. If you get a call, then it's true. You either get a call or you don't get a call. But when you get a call, then chances are that there was either a burglary or that there was an earthquake. And initially, you might use just the tables of the graph, the probabilities, to compute that. We're going to learn on uh, Friday how to compute these probabilities. Okay. How to automatically compute the probability that there's been a burglar, or that the probability that uh, there was um, 
uh, there was an end. Now let's assume that in addition you get um, you switch on the radio and there uh, and say that radio is a variable that is on means that it's telling you there was an earthquake and zero means it's telling you it's not telling you that there was an earthquake. But let's assume you switch on the radio and the radio tells you there was an earthquake today. Now the question is, is are my current probabilities good or should I update it? Update. Update. So I update them. So now it's much more probable that there was indeed an earthquake. Okay. If this is uh, true and this is false, and like here to answer like a question was asked at the back, sometimes you just need to compute the probability of true because the probability of false is one minus the probability of true. So I only focus on computing the true. And likewise, the probability of a goes down. Okay, so, probabilistic inference has this property that you have a graph, and as, as you're observing these nodes, you're automatically recalculating the probabilities of all the other nodes. So, at any point in time, you're a, you, you have a good sense of what, where the system is, where, what value each variable is. You know whether there's been a burglary, you know whether the alarm is on, you know whether there's an earthquake, and so on. You don't know it exactly, but you only know it in a probabilistic sense. Because maybe the radio is telling you there was an earthquake, but the radio hasn't told you where the earthquake was. So there's always an uncertain amount of uncertainty. Now. Uh, this phenomenon of being able to acquire a new variable that allows you to um, discern between two events being happening is called explaining away. In other words, we didn't know whether there was a burglary or an earthquake, but once we get the radio report, we are able to explain this, uh, uh, what, what has happened. Pardon? Oh yes, you could also have a burglary and an earthquake. That's why you still have a little bit of probability here. Okay. Now, we also um, um, introduced this graph in the last class, which was is something that I call, we're going to call the sprinkler network. And the rest of this lecture, the slides in this lecture, will make use of the sprinkler network. We're going to ask all sorts of questions about the sprinkler. The first question that we will ask, and, then, and let's assume that all these numbers have been given. Someone told us that the probability of, the, of it being cloudy is 0.5. This again is not Vancouver. <laughs> um, someone said that the probability, um, the probability that the sprinkler is not on, or otherwise F, given that it is cloudy, is equal to uh, 0 0.9 and so on. So that's what these numbers do. These numbers give us all the uh, uh, tables. And now I might want to ask the following questions. What's the probability that it is raining? What is the probability that the sprinkler is on given that the grass is wet? So as I'm getting observations, I would like to answer questions quick. And there's two ways to do this. There's the dumb way, which is exponential computation. And there is a smart way, which will be sort of polynomial. And in fact, for HMMs, we'll be following on. Uh, and that's what we're going to do in the next class. We're going to do this the two ways, and then, we'll, and then you'll see how to actually do inference efficiently, and that will prepare us to do HMMs easily or much.